Well, heart disease can be very different in women than it is in men. And joining us now to talk more about this is Dr. Allison Patagimas, who recently joined Consulting Cardiologist. Thank you for being with us, doctor. Thank you so much for setting this up. I'm new to the area and wanted to reach out to patients. So I'm glad we could do it safely and virtually in the time of the pandemic. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. It's so important to get information out there. I know a lot of people have been avoiding the hospitals. We've been doing many interviews with doctors that they've been getting cases that are a little too far along because people maybe aren't going for their checkups, not getting questions answered. You specialize in cardiovascular disease in women and cardio oncology. Talk about those two merging together, what you're looking at. Yeah, so I think the first thing you said is really an important thing to highlight, especially in cardiology where diseases that present too late can have really bad outcomes that are preventable. And we know that, you know, it's very scary to think about going to the hospital at this point, but when people have symptoms that may be a heart attack, this really still needs to be evaluated urgently and emergently in the hospital. And cardiology patients generally have different areas in the hospital that they can be safe from COVID. Um, and it's really important to get checked out if that may be going on. And sort of um, getting into the second thing you said, I do specialize in seeing general cardiovascular disease in women. Um, and women have a lot of the same disease processes that men have in terms of heart problems, but there can be differences in how women present and also what diseases they encounter. So one, one important area to highlight is that Cardiac disease is the main killer, the highest cause of death for both men and women, causing death in one out of three women. So this is something we need to take very, very seriously. A lot of times women are, are the main caretaker for the family and they don't you know, focus on themselves or listen to their own symptoms quite as seriously. So it's a big deal. Well, and let's talk about the symptoms because... Uh, I've done many stories with uh, situations like this, and I'm always amazed when I interview women who didn't realize they were on the verge of what could have been a deadly heart attack because they thought, oh, I just had bad indigestion or I was a little tired. Um, sometimes the symptoms that we blow off because there's a lot going on could be very serious. What do we need to call the doctor for? Yeah, exactly. So um, the most common symptom that both men and women will have when experiencing a heart attack is chest pain. But that being said, women are more likely than men to have some atypical symptoms when they're having a heart attack. And one of them you mentioned can be a feeling of indigestion rather than true chest pain. So if that's something that's abnormal or out of the usual for you and you start feeling indigestion, that should be taken seriously. Other more atypical features of heart attacks that women can have include shortness of breath, feeling lightheaded or faint, um, feeling nauseous, clammy, sweaty, and sometimes pain in either the abdomen or the back instead of the chest. So all of those things really need to be taken seriously, especially if they're not something that you've ever felt before or they come on suddenly. Well, a lot of people say, oh, indigestion, that's so common. But I guess indigestion for no reason, like you didn't just eat a big thing of wings and you're wondering why do I have this major burning? <laughs> um, and what, it, what should we call immediately 911 or you call someone like yourself or you call your primary care? We really want women to take action, but sometimes it's hard to know what step one should be. Yeah, that's definitely true. And it's it's more challenging in women because the symptoms can be, be more vague. and so you know, we can't react every single time that we have some of these more vague symptoms, like a little bit of nausea or a little bit of heartburn. The things that make us worry more um, are if this happens and it's really unusual for you, if there's no other clear provoking factor, like you said, wings or some, you know, spicy food or anything different about your routine, then we take this very seriously. And Honestly, the safest course of action if something feels abnormal to you is to go to the emergency room if it could be a heart attack and, you know, see a cardiologist and follow up later is okay, but not if you think you might be having a heart attack. That's always a medical emergency. Yeah, and, and, and as you said, it can be subtle. So you really want women, the doctors aren't going to be mad for you to come in. They're going to be like, that was a good thing that you got safe and, and got checked out. And especially you want to stress that Going to the ER is not a dangerous thing anymore. They really do have COVID separated. What's dangerous, it seems like what we're hearing from these stories is when people don't go to the ER and they wait. Exactly, and especially with heart attacks. Um, I think you're exactly right that 
back in the spring, it was a little bit different when um, PP and protection wasn't as available and we didn't know as much about COVID. And now with the proper precautions and the proper equipment, patients are pretty safe even when the, the virus has spread to high numbers. And as you said, a heart attack can be pretty subtle. No doctor or a nurse or any healthcare staff is ever gonna you know, think it was the wrong thing to come in and get checked if you think you may be having a heart attack. And on the flip side of that, staying home can be really dangerous or even deadly. We have seen since COVID started that people are presenting later and later from heart attacks and there's a lot more complications that happen when we're not able to treat a heart attack very early. Early detection is key. So what do you want people to really know about their risk factors and their symptoms? So risk factors is another important area that's a little bit different for women than men. So the classic risk factors for heart attacks include things like if you have bad genes with early heart attacks in your family, we always take that very seriously. Um, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, high cholesterol, all of those can create problems in the blood vessels that lead to heart attacks. In women, there's also issues with reproductive hormones and obviously those change throughout a woman's life, either with pregnancy or with menopause. And that can change a cardiovascular risk profile at a later time for women compared to men and sort of brings on a whole new set of symptoms and problems at a later time in life that needs to be taken very seriously. So the risk factors need to, you know, really be paid attention to in women differently than men. And I think, you know, we've already discussed the symptoms that can be a little bit more vague in women as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, treatment options. I know that every day science is getting better, but what do you want to let people know about their treatment options, especially with early detection? Yeah, so with early detection, heart attacks are really a disease that can be overcome with both intervention and medical treatment. So the, the way a heart attack works is that a blood vessel gets blocked off and there's not enough blood flow to the heart muscle. And we now have the ability to identify where this is happening and intervene very rapidly to restore blood flow and keep the heart alive so that there is really no long-term side effects of the damage that could have been done. The important thing is that every minute that goes by that the, the blood isn't getting to the heart muscle damages the heart muscle more. So since it starts, every single minute counts until we're able to get the blood flow restored. And then after somebody does have a heart attack, medications are really instrumental in preventing second heart attacks or other vascular events like strokes, which can be related to similar plaque building processes. What screening should people be getting to know their risk? So screening depends a little bit on what exact risk factors you have. A primary care provider can do general screening and in people who have more of the risk factors that we discussed, it's always a good idea to see a cardiologist to make sure that we're being really aggressive about controlling risk factors, either in the primary prevention setting, which means even before you have a heart attack, which obviously would be more ideal or after somebody's had a heart attack. And the things we look at are cholesterol levels, what someone's blood pressure is, um, if they have any evidence of diabetes or bad blood sugar handling. Um, there's also newer imaging technologies along the lines of stress tests or even CT scans that can look for calcium in the arteries that can help us look for plaque buildup before it results in a heart attack. Yeah, and you are new to consulting cardiologists, but you have, uh, you're have you welcoming new patients in both Wallingford, Pace, uh, Cheshire, and West Hartford. So the next question is, how do you know if you need to go see a cardiologist if you don't have one already? I think, yeah, so um, I am excited to see new patients in those locations, as you said, and um, in all of the nine locations that consulting cardiologists has, we're continuing to see patients or accommodate phone visits during the pandemic. So we definitely want people to continue their regular cardiology care to stay healthy. Um, knowing when to see a cardiologist is kind of a little bit up to the patient and a little bit up to the doctor. So if there's any risk factor that's hard to control, we're happy to see patients to help with that. Um, if anyone has had a heart event in the past, obviously we're happy to help manage that or prevent any recurrence of any heart events, whether it's heart attack, which we've spent a long time talking about, 
or other common heart problems like valve problems, heart failure, heart rhythm problems. And honestly, if someone isn't sure if they should see a cardiologist or not, I would welcome people to come in and see us because it always helps to sort of get a different perspective on um, you know, somebody's risk and somebody's disease process. And often just talking with the patient and being able to get to the bottom of what someone's worrying about really helps make people live a happier, more energetic life without so much worry. Yeah, and you just, I mean, if you're worried about it, chances are you probably should go see one because if nothing else, you can really get tested and have some peace of mind or get some treatment that might be necessary to prevent a heart attack. Exactly, and you know, without some more investigation, whether it's lab tests or imaging tests, sometimes it's really hard to know whether you know a symptom that you have is concerning or not. So this is something that people can go uh, to cardiologist, uh, consultingcardiologist.com, um, and there's a phone number people can call, 203-265-9831. Is there anything else you want folks to know about um, making sure, especially women, during this time? Actually, I have a question for you. There's so much stress right now, and our mental health is being affected. I know a lot of people are saying that I'm not sure if what I'm experiencing is stress, am I having a panic attack, or is something wrong with your heart? Is that something you can discern, or that's something you need to get investigated? I think that's a really common issue that we're seeing now, um, both questions about heart conditions related to COVID and also heart conditions related to some of the mental health side effects that people are experiencing with the pandemic. Anxiety certainly can cause some cardiac conditions or cardiac symptoms, and sometimes it's hard to know the difference. So, you know, in the past when we would be anxious about something, we were probably being chased by a lion or something like that, and the normal response for your body is to have a surge of adrenaline and lots of chemicals and hormones that make you ready to fight or run away. And now in the modern world, we get stressed about things like, you know, an email from a boss or something that we're watching on the news and your body's response is sort of this same, you know, flow of hormones and, and stress and chemicals in the bloodstream. But instead of being ready to prepare you to run away, you're just sitting on the couch. So your body still gets revved up by everything that's going on in your normal response to anxiety but it sort of feels like an uncomfortable surge of energy and anxiety and palpitations. And sometimes, you know, this can be managed by getting to the bottom of what's being the source of stress, whether it's with medications or talking to a counselor. But other times, you know, the, the levels of stress hormones in the body can really be toxic to the heart. And it's not just a sensation that people have, but it can truly lead to things like extra heartbeats or even, you know, dysfunction of the heart muscle that we need to take seriously. So for symptoms like that, that continue on despite efforts at controlling anxiety, I think it's definitely a good idea to be checked out. Right. And a professional can really help you determine because the good news is if you don't find anything wrong with someone's heart, they might know, all right, I just need to work on de-stressing my life. Uh, and that can also allow you to have some peace of mind if you go get a scan and make sure everything is in working order. Exactly. And the other thing related to the pandemic that we're seeing a lot now is, you know, we're learning more about COVID, the virus, and how it affects people both up front in the immediate setting and also more long term down the line. So people who have survived COVID have been, you know, having some heart related symptoms as well. And as a field, we're still sort of learning what implications surviving the virus has. And as with other organ systems, it really spans a very big spectrum of severity. But we have been seeing patients who have, you know, some changes from inflammation to the heart that they've experienced during the virus as well. So that's another reason to, you know, definitely see a cardiologist if you're someone who has had the virus and has overcome the immediate setting, but now you're having you know, symptoms of chest tightness, shortness of breath, palpitations, anything that's new, we are learning that the virus can affect the heart as well, both immediately and also in the more chronic setting. Absolutely. The long haulers as we hear more and more stories. So, so much to think about, but the good news is uh, there is uh, a place to go locally for help. Just want to let folks know that you're with Consulting Cardiologists and they can go to consultingcardiologist.com and 
Uh, welcome to the area, doctor, because uh, nice to have you. And I know you're just here and you're starting to take some new patients, which could bring some peace of mind and hopefully some good health to those who reach out. Definitely. Thank you, doctor, for sharing the information. You're welcome. Um, the, other, the other group of patients who I see in specialty is patients who have cardio-oncology concerns. Mm. And cardio-oncology is a field within cardiology that specializes in taking care of patients' hearts as they go through cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. Mm. And this, we know, is critically important because patients who develop heart-related dysfunction or heart problems during their cancer treatment have worse outcomes related to both their heart problems and also their cancer diagnosis because they're not able to complete their cancer treatment sometimes. So we see patients you know, who have either pre-existing heart disease or pre-existing heart risk factors, sometimes even before they start cancer treatment. Otherwise, a lot of patients either with these risk factors or even patients who have no prior heart history can develop certain toxicities depending on which cancer therapy they're receiving during treatment that we're happy to help manage so that you know, cancer treatment can be continued in as aggressive a manner as possible. And even late into survivorship, we're seeing across the board with lots of different cancers that luckily patients are experiencing much improved survival. For example, in breast cancer, there's been almost a 40% improvement in survival in the last three decades, which is really amazing. And um, we're seeing that patients who survive cancer long-term do go on to sometimes have heart problems that their peers without cancer don't have. So really along the whole spectrum, we are happy to see patients who uh, may have heart problems related to their, their cancer diagnosis and make sure that we're able to get them the best possible care. Right, and great that you can have someone like yourself in cardio-oncology where you can have someone looking at both things. So we appreciate you clarifying that for us. Yep, exactly. All right, thank you, doctor. And again, it's a Consulting Cardiologist. You can go to consultingcardiologist.com and ask for Dr. Patagima. So we appreciate you being here, doctor. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be back in the area, and I'm really excited. Welcome back.